molt bona tarda a tothom i feliç de presentar aquest seminari que hem titulat Modalitats i iniciatives de reparació, restitució i repatriació. És un seminari que, com sabeu, s'organitza arran de l'exposició d'Ariela Aixa Azulay que tenim a la planta de biblioteca. L'exposició es titula Errata i ha reunit vuit projectes d'aquesta autora. I dic autora sabent que és una persona que treballa en l'àmbit de l'escriptura, de la recerca, de la investigació i del treball amb arxius, amb la fotografia, no des de dintre de la fotografia. Aleshores, és una exposició en la qual hem intentat donar una visió transversal de les recerques que representa i que ha dut a terme Ariela en els darrers deu anys, des de Unshowable Photographs, imatges no mostrades, a treballs com la història natural de la violació o en NOF, on es fa una exemplar crítica de la Declaració Universal dels Drets Humans. You are not getting the translation? Are you? Not really? Estava dient que l'exposició d'Ariela Aixa Solay és una enorme possibilitat de trobar una transversalitat entre investigacions que parteixen del que se'n diu el llarg conflicte entre Israel i Palestina, passant per una investigació sobre l'abús sobre el cos de la dona en els dies després de la Segona Guerra Mundial i a la vegada un treball també sobre l'ús que se n'ha fet dels objectes o obres d'art en períodes colonials, en períodes imperials o també en períodes de postguerra on tant els cossos de les dones com les obres d'art són objectes a ser monitoritzats i tractats pels vencedors sovint. Per tant, són una reunió de projectes que a més a més revelen un treball amb els arxius fotogràfics i que ens parlen de l'economia d'accés en aquests arxius, és a dir, de com es pot arribar a fer un ús i quan no es pot fer un ús, quan hi ha un impediment per poder parlar-ne amb els arxius, com podem subvertir aquests bloquejos ahir deia en una petita reunió, en una activitat que teníem a dalt, que penso que el treball d'Ariela és un treball de sentit comú, de sentit comú quan sembla que, diguéssim, els ordres polítics, els ordres imperials bloquegen qualsevol lectura alternativa dels fets, com guanyem la possibilitat d'elaborar els nostres relats, els relats que ens interessen. Ariela és força coneguda com a escriptora, el llibre que potser la va fer més famosa va ser The Civil Contract of Photography, que es va publicar l'any 2008 per Zone Books. Des d'aleshores, aquest llibre, que ja té una mica més de deu anys, no ha deixat de generar un interessant debat i s'ha convertit en una eina, com passa amb tot el que ella fa, una eina de treball. Quan a dalt circules de projecte en projecte, la sensació que tens és que estàs davant d'una caixa d'eines, davant d'uns termes, d'unes experiències i d'unes propostes que es converteixen en solucions a problemes extrapolables als que ella ha tractat. Evidentment, el que origina aquest seminari és l'últim dels seus projectes, Errata, un projecte que dit molt ràpidament posa la llum sobre l'asimetria que es produeix entre aquesta enorme quantitat d'objectes etnogràfics, objectes artístics, extrets, pillats, robats, manllevats, a vegades fins i tot comprats a Àfrica i a altres llocs i que ara es mostren en museus occidentals i que es mostren envoltats per la tecnologia acadèmica, per la tecnologia científica, sigui de la història de l'art, de l'etnografia, de la museologia o de la història tot curt. El que Ariela diu, o el que Ariela exposa, és la asimetria aberrant entre l'extrema documentació d'aquests objectes i aquells que anomenem com indocumentats. Aquells que venen d'aquelles comunitats on aquests objectes van ser manllevats, van ser presos i que quan arriben com indocumentats el que proposaria ella o el que proposaríem és considerar aquests objectes tan ben relatats com els passaports globals d'aquestes persones. 
Aquesta és una proposta que pot semblar agosarada, però és molt senzilla, és molt pràctica. A més, aquestes persones venen a trobar aquests objectes, superen o intenten anar a trencar la distància que ha produït un règim colonial, un règim imperial, una altra de les qüestions que estan presents en el seu treball i que ha elaborat extensament en l'últim dels seus llibres, que és Potential History and Learning Imperialism, un llibre que va sortir el mes passat i que aquí m'han anat portant còpies i s'han anat esgotant. Hem portat més còpies i s'han esgotat. I hem portat més còpies perquè avui algú que el vulgui comprar ho pugui comprar. Un llibre d'absoluta urgència i necessitat on Ariel ha guanyat encara un estil més directe fent d'aquesta relació entre l'anàlisi de la fotografia i de la filosofia política la pinça que ens ofereix els debats més urgents i més importants com el que volem dur a terme aquesta tarda. Un debat plantejat amb aquest títol que us he anunciat abans però que compta amb la presència, a més a més, d'Ariel Aixa Solai, de François Vergès, Susan Meisselas i Kader Atia. Per tant, jo crec que és una ocasió increïble, immillorable, d'escoltar tres dones i un home que treballen i fan propostes actives sobre com reparar els danys produïts per una llarga i prolongada durada d'un règim colonial que encara que ens assembli que políticament ha estat en certa manera desmantellat persisteix, persisteix entre altres llocs als museus on el discurs que arropa que embolcalla aquests objectes es continua propagant és a dir, el que ataca Ariel Aixa Solà és precisament els mecanismes de propagació d'aquests discursos que permeten veure de manera natural aquests objectes fora dels seus llocs, fora de les seves comunitats. Aniré resumint ràpidament i no faré grans introduccions dels ponents, penso que són força conegudes i força conegut, Kader, com per a abundar excessivament Ràpidament, Françoise Vergès, ella ha estat una de les veus més importants a França en la crítica i en la constitució de la memòria de l'esclavatge en comitès oficials i també en un treball acadèmic que ha abordat els entrecruaments entre el feminisme, la crítica del racisme i del passat esclavista. Ella ha treballat amb artistes, amb institucions artístiques, la qual cosa revela que aquests espais, tot i ser llocs presentats neutrament com museus, i és un aspecte que haurem de treballar i criticar profundament, aquesta dita neutralitat, que no és tal, són a la vegada llocs d'oportunitats i d'aliances molt necessàries que es poden produir com les que ella ha generat col·laborant, com dic, amb Documenta o amb la Trienal de París o realitzant pel·lícules sobre Frans Fanon i MSZ. Tenim també a Susan Meisselas, per nosaltres és ja una és algú de la família, ella va tenir una exposició aquí a la Fundació Tàpies, Mediations, que vam produir conjuntament amb el JetPom, i Susan té un lloc en aquest debat, en la mesura que tot el seu treball ha constituït sempre un esforç per retornar la imatge fotogràfica al lloc del qual havia estat presa i capturada. Aquest enunciat tan simple la compromet enormement a restituir permanentment allò que la fotografia extreu de realitats molt diverses, sigui de Nicaragua o de Kurdistan. No abundaré en la seva presentació, sabeu que ella és presidenta de Magnum, una activa promotora de projectes, juntament amb Jessica Murray, que també la tenim aquí amb nosaltres i que sempre ens ha ajudat a que aquestes propostes tinguin més impacte. I Kader Atia, també l'últim dels ponents avui, que crec que està per arribar, però bé, com que sabeu que hi ha una vaga a França, això ha complicat una mica la mobilitat tant de François com Kader. Kader també és algú molt conegut aquí, entre altres coses va estudiar a l'escola Massana, tot i que ara és un artista internacionalment reconegut, o ara és un artista internacionalment reconegut, i jo diria que una de les grans creacions de Kader és la colonia, un espai. Igual que Susan 
no és només una fotògrafa que produeix imatges, sinó una fotògrafa que fa possibles els projectes dels altres, en aquest sentit afavoreix la producció. Cader amb la Coloní també ha produït o ha generat un espai de debat, un espai de trobada per precisament portar a terme aquestes crítiques de colonials. Aquí aturo les presentacions i ara quatre coses pràctiques molt ràpides. Aquest seminari, aquesta exposició ha estat possible perquè hi ha persones darrere treballant i cuidant els detalls. Sobretot he d'esmentar Núria Soler que ha coordinat aquest projecte europeu que és el que permet l'exposició, és el que permet aquest seminari i és el que permet una publicació completament gratuïta que teniu aquí en català, castellà i anglès, perquè l'agafeu. És la publicació de l'exposició d'Ariela. O sigui que, sisplau, feu-ne ús, agafeu-lo, llegiu-lo, val la pena. I, sobretot, també veieu l'exposició. Però també he d'esmentar a Sandra Fortó, que va coordinar l'exposició, tota la logística, Maria Sellarés, que sempre coordina aquestes activitats i Iones que el tenim allí també garantint que tot això funcioni igual que Quim i totes les persones que estan ajudant-nos a la cabina de traducció. Passo la paraula a Ariela i li agraeixo enormement el treball que permet aquests debats tan necessaris i tan urgents, igual que la bona predisposició per organitzar exposicions, activitats, aquesta setmana la tenim molt amortitzada amb trobades amb diferents col·lectius de la ciutat, des de Ciutat Refugi, La Bon, una mica perquè us feu idea de la utilitat, insisteixo, del treball d'Ariela. Gràcies a tots. Ok, so uh, I really want to express my gratitude to Carles Guerra for your generous, uh, generous uh, introduction now, but for the, all the work that we did throughout the years together. And I think that it's really uh, a pleasure and it's exception in, institu in art institutions to have such a deep uh, dialogue about the work. I started uh, this dialogue, uh, or Carlos initiated it, I think, already 10 years ago, and throughout several rounds, we were able, I think, to come up with this exhibition uh, that is the work of many, many years, and it's rare to have in art institutions directors and curators that are willing to get so deeply into this kind of work and are committed to this kind of work that is less and less possible to pursue in art institutions. Uh, and I know from some friends who visited the exhibition and had the pleasure to have Carlos uh, having a guided tour in the exhibition. And I heard yesterday Carlos giving a guided tour in my exhibition. And it was such a pleasure to hear someone who is really committed to the work and committed to what is behind the work, which is not only my work, is this commitment to think differently about uh, 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 the world that we are sharing and how we can go farther and uh, uh, use these kind of institutions to develop an anti-imperial and non-imperial thinking. So really thank you, Carles, for all these years of work together on this exhibition. And I would like also uh, to express my gratitude uh, to Nuria and Sandra, with whom we worked also on this exhibition and the programming. And I think that it's really important to have this kind of programming together with this kind of work, because, you know, it's not uh, a typical artwork that you come and you are... Uh, you say, wow, it requires work from you, from the staff, from me, because there is a lot of work to do in order maybe to make this world a little bit better. And in this perspective of trying to think differently and with a commitment to non-colonial, non-imperial narratives, tomorrow evening there is a screening of my film here and then some you know, Q&A about the film. And later after that, there is uh, a very uh, uh, unique event that is going on. It's a live experiment with uh, this looted box that is in show in the exhibition, those of you who had the opportunity to see this box, you saw an object, you read some things about it, but tomorrow there is a, a, a live experiment run by Agar Ophir, the artist Agar Ophir and Juna Suleiman, uh, which is an attempt to generate different histories with your help as an audience. So those who are uh, are here today, I invite you to participate in tomorrow's evening uh, because we need you in order to generate these kind of different stories. And in this case, it's Agar Ophir and Juna Suleiman who need your presence there. So uh, I welcome you there tomorrow. Uh, I invite you to be there tomorrow. So uh, 
Let me start with my lecture. So as you already saw the exhibition, I'm assuming, uh, I would like to reflect a little bit about this practice that I call it errata. You know, I practiced errata for many, many years, but after I finished the exhibition and the book came out, it was an opportunity for me to ask myself, what am I doing exactly? So I will share with you some thoughts. Uh, maybe we need to turn li dim a little bit the light. Maybe not, I don't know, you will tell me later. So uh, some few mistakes in printing are here remarked, as you see in this little uh, piece of errata. Forgive us for these errors, these kind of notes tell you. This is a common opening sentence for errata notes. We know them, they are sometimes inserted into books. This loose sheet of paper inserted into a publication is a common way of saying we won't let errors stand. Though the errors cannot be physically corrected because the books were already published, readers are provided with their textual substitutes. Publishers and authors use the opportunity to separate the errors from what must otherwise be flawless research and scholarship. They often praise the author's virtues, the author who has done her best to rely on updated sources and accurate facts available and include notes of common wisdom about the inevitability of mistakes in uh, any human endeavor. Errata deliver a reassuring message of accountability for one's words and responsibility towards a certain readership, those readers engaged in singling out those heroes that are being allegedly corrected with these kind of uh, sheets of paper. The assumption is that wrong inscriptions ought to be replaced. The name of Judas cannot stay where the name of Jesus should have been written. You see here the little errata Jesus underneath which there is the name of Judas. Alongside errata notes, documents sh such as the US Constitution can also be appended but with amendments. While the former errata are meant to address typographical errors and small factual mistakes like Judas and Jesus, the latter, the amendments, are meant to deal with political wrongs and supply needed reforms. Yet, political wrongs cannot be fixed with more documents issued by the same actors who perpetrated the wrongs, the crimes, in the first place, and whose right to do wrong and now to right these wrongs through papers have never been abolished. When violence is perpetrated with and through documents, it is meant to last and be reproduced through the mediation of the archive. The provenance and trajectories of this violence are hard to track since they are congealed in a regime of papers. Amendments to documents of violence, like the amendments to the US Constitution, which claim the land of indigenous people, are meant to mark a past injustice as if the original injustice was sealed in the past and can now be amended with another law again imposed top-down by imperial actors. In other words, amendments proclaim that violence is over, thus foreclosing efforts of victims to determine what reparations might be and whether the initial violence is indeed over. What I'm proposing is errata in retro prospect. We used to say in retrospect. In retrospect is looking back. In retro prospect is going back, which is not really back, but let's say going back in order to generate the future of those moments that were declared belong to the past. So errata in retro prospect is based on a refusal to accept the movement forward that imperial violence dictates. A refusal, a refusal to say that the violence that was, done in, uh, that was done is now really done. Errata in retroprospect is an insistence that much of imperial violence is... Sorry, now I know why I cannot concentrate. I hear myself in Catalan. <laughs> okay. So errata in retroprospect is an insistence that much of imperial violence is reversible 
and the prospects and opportunities that were stolen from people ought to be restored. So not only was what was taken from people ought to be restored, but also the potentialities, the possibilities, the opportunities that were taken from them should be restored and can be recovered with the abolition of imperial rights. Errata in retrospect refuses the authority of the imperial document. Those of you who saw the exhibition, you saw my struggle with documents and my will to use scissors, to use pen, to use tapes in order to desacralize these documents and to generate a different type of work with them. While errata and amendments are seen to have separate functions, they are mediated through the same technology of imperial violence, this technology which I call the archive. The split between the two procedures, errata and amendments, and the different realms associated with them, the republic of papers on the one hand and the realm of politics on the other, turn scholars into readers and truth guardians of documents, the same documents that imperial actors manufacture and archive. Scholars are trained to consult documents to sustain their claims and to refrain from accounting for wrongs if they don't find a specific document that testify to an unjust policy or intention. They are commended to handle all documents in the same way, regardless of the violence the documents naturalize, from stolen land turned into sovereign states to the life worlds of others that they turn into private property. Let me briefly illustrate this with an example. This is not a daguerreotype. You know this image as a daguerreotype. This is not a daguerreotype, claims Tamara Lanier, descendant of Renty Taylor in a lawsuit filed in March this year. Holding the photograph of her great-great-grandfather, she shows the camera where he belongs with his family. Her list of errata does not end here. Renty Taylor's photograph was not taken from him, as we used to say in relation to photography. It was seized from him, as Lanier's lawsuit indicates. This is important because her lawsuit rests on the idea that imperial violence is perpetuated as long as the imperial right to seize and hold what was seized is not abolished. That is, Lanier's claim should not be understood simply as the restitution of an object document, the daguerreotype, but as an onto-epistemological challenge to the imperial archive itself. What is at stake is finally letting uh, uh, Renty Taylor be free, free from the hands of those who still refuse to relinquish what they seized under the protection of the legal language that slavery created, including the language of art and history that transform violence, the violence of taking a photograph of a slave, uh, uh, into precious objects to be preserved in museums and archive. Let me say it again, this is not a daguerreotype. This means that the archival inscription that says this is a daguerreotype and hence it should be continued to be held by Harvard Inst uh, University or the Peabody Museum is not only incorrect, but this is a historical wrong. It would have been disingenuous to speak about imperial violence in terms of errors and their correction if the uniqueness of imperial violence did not reside exactly so precisely in print culture. First and foremost, imperial violence rests in the manufacture of world-destroying uh, documents through which the imperial right to manufacture documents and force reality to mirror those documents is reproduced. As long as the sacredness and untouchability of the document in which those imperial rights are congealed is preserved through allegedly benign professions, fields of expertise the arch and archival procedures, the imperial organization of the world will be protected. This is how imperialism is reproduced through our critical skills as scholars. Time matters. It matters since some of the wrong perpetuated with and through papers ought to cease to exist. 
Imperial temporality claims the right to state unilaterally when its violence ends. According to imperial timelines, Renty Taylor is free since slavery has been abolished. Lanier rejects this timeline and calls to free Renty. Renty, she says, and she produced this uh, uh, composite image and text. Renty, she says, is not free as long as imperial rights of the archive are not abolished and the world in which they could be exercised is not uh, uh, repaired. The proliferation of documents involved in slavery illustrate not only that a document could testify that a person was a slave, but that others had the right to manufacture documents of enslavement. And you know this image when you go to the archive and when you encounter it in uh, history books, you encounter an image with the caption, this is a slave auction. This is not a slave auction. We have to cease to repeat archive captions. This is trafficking in bodies, a moment when a person that were kidnapped from Africa are being made slaves through this document. And of course, a lot of violence. But I'm calling your attention to look at these documents that hold the life of a person in this uh, uh, crucial moment of their transformation from a person into slave. And it doesn't end here. When we speak about manumission, when slaved, uh, enslaved people were uh, made free by their owners, with quotation mark, by those who trafficked in their bodies, this manumission goes through documents. And even when it comes to the Emancipation Proclamation, what does this guy called Lincoln is doing? He's reading the proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation, that says that now they are freed. So this culture of documents is what I am engaging with. Documents were and still are power over others. In this sense, Du Bois' account of the general strike of enslaved people that forced civil war to abolish slavery is the ultimate errata. It abolished papers altogether. The slave, Du Bois says, were not freed through these documents. The slave, 250,000 slaves, just didn't show up to their position of labor, or if you can call it position of labor, the position of slavery, but they just didn't show up. They didn't show up. What Du Bois is doing in his account of uh, reconstruction that he calls black reconstruction, he calls it the general strike. This what brought you know, the war uh, uh, to be determined, and this what brought Lincoln to uh, sign the uh, errata. But slavery was abolished by the slaves with no documents whatsoever. With this phrase, let me go back to uh, Lanier. With this phrase, Lanier inscribed on the image of Renty Taylor, bound by Harvard for 169 years. With this phrase, phrase, Lanier claims that Harvard continues to hold Taylor as its property and that the university hides behind the neutral language of museums, archives, and academia that themselves constituted slavery. Harvard's seizure uh, and archiving hamper the completion of the project of freedom. Imagine errata in retrospect as a form of going on strike. Imagine ceasing to be the respectable operators of the technology of the archive that keeps imperial archives in place and refusing its temporal, spatial, and political commands. An unruly errata rejects the rules of the game. That is the truth claim of imperial categories. What would it mean to claim that this is not the state of Israel and instead that this is Palestine? Not Palestine to come, but Palestine is always already there. An onto-epistemological transformation of imperial realities. Errata in retrospect is a living formation under siege by imperial claims. This document proclaimed a reality. As I told you, documents are power over others, the creation of the state of Israel. When it was proclaimed, this reality has already been manufactured through the expulsion of 250,000 Palestinians from their homes, the robbery of their lands, and the destruction of the life world of which they were part. The expulsion of an additional 500,000 Palestinians during 1949 was already facilitated by this document, followed by international recognition of Israel's sovereign uh, state. 
Imperial documents were invented to legalize expropriation and deny the dispossess their rights, which had been previously inscribed in worldly formations of people, objects, landscapes, memories, and stories. Documents of this kind have a name. This one is called the Declaration of the State of the Declaration of the Independence of the State of Israel. It is, however, the document through which Palestine was proclaimed non-existent. So I'm not speaking only about the destruction of Palestine, I'm speaking about the proclamation that Palestine does not exist, maybe an entity to come, but does not exist. As I have said, and many have remarked, documents don't simply record existing relations. Instead, imperialism works through documents. Farther, though, alongside the primitive accumulation of existing resources, such as lands and artifacts, imperialism generated a visual and textual wealth uh, that makes document-based scholarship, regardless of its content, content, part of an imperial technology of violence. The invention of documents prompted the invention of different types of scholars and experts, historians, museum curators, archivists, etc. These scholars are expected to relate to documents as neutral, as archives, while they are commanded to inhabit the temporal and spatial lines the documents draw and respect them with their factuality. Transgression of the document itself is intolerable. Who would say that after 1948, this place called Israel is still Palestine? Interpretations, however, can proliferate. Offering alternate interpretations works to maintain the inviolability of uh, uh, the document thus made original. So here you see the guy who nominated himself to be the head of the state of Israel. I erase, this is a kind of errata, another type of errata. I erase those faces of the people around him and I kept the document uh, uh, in the center. So here we see the same guy here signing the document, the signature that uh, 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 is appended to the document. Historians are free to interpret documents and write different histories out of these documents as long as they recognize the temporal when, the spatial where, and the political who, all these markers of the manufactured realities. Like like, for example, manufacturing the state of Israel. To offer errata in retrospect is to practice potential history. Potential history in this case is the rejection of Israel as an object of research and the assertion that Palestine exi exists exactly when and where it was said to have disappeared, and not only in these two areas called the West Bank and Gaza. In this sense, the great march of return that started in March 2018 did not start then. It takes place whenever Palestinians assert their right to be in Palestine. When this man proclaimed the creation of the State of Israel by signing this document, the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians was already ensured in order to bring into reality what was inscribed in the document, which is a state for the Jews. Enabled by international legal language and documents, this possession could be pursued in front of organizations such as the Red Cross, who reassured the world that deportation is actually repatriation, and it, was, uh, it is proce proce proceeding legally according to the accepted documents that could call the expulsion of Palestinian uh, to Jordan repatriations. This image uh, of this Palestinian man here in the middle, was taken during one of these deportation operations. His image is still filed in the archive of the Red Cross as a prisoner of war. When I asked the archive uh, to show it in an exhibition, the answer was unequivocal. I could show it only with its original caption, which you can see, oh no, I did which you can see here. Prisoner of war interrogated uh, at the presence of uh, uh, the uh, Red Cross delegate, and uh, there are already sect Jewish sector and Arab sectors, which are complete fabrications with uh, the uh, assistance of these organizations. Uh, so they told me, only if you show it with this original uh, title. I declined. From the moment I saw this photograph, 
I have no doubt that this man is not a prisoner of war, of war, nor a refugee, as Palestinians started to be called in photographic captions taken during their expulsion around 48. Any one of you can go to the Red Cross archive if you like, but I am not allowed to show you this image. That I traced it, but I am not an artist, so this is not a drawing. This is what I call an unshowable photograph that I use as a placeholder as long as the photograph continues to be held in uh, the Red Cross archives in Geneva under this caption. Refusing to recognize people in the categories provided through archival violence and preserved through the archival document, this is part of what errata should yield. This is the practice of potential history. But as you could see, I'm not the only one who is uh, offering errata. This is a document from September 48, a few months after the creation of the State of Israel, and the government of Palestine is erased, and here you have in Hebrew, right to left, Medinat Israel, which is the State of Israel. In a nation state, the birth of a, a citizen is already mobilized to turn others into refugees, infiltrators, and stateless. The endurance of these categories is premised on a citizen's recognition. To errata these categories cannot be separated from the citizens offering an erratum to their national identity, in my case, the identity of Israel, Israeli. Being born Israeli, I refuse to recognize myself as an Israeli, and I refuse to recognize myself in this document that testify that I am an Israeli, which means that he is a refugee. When I offer this erratum to my own citizenship, going on strike against the archive, the Palestinian man in the unshowable photograph, this one, becomes a person in common with me, rather than an object of research from begone time. Because as a scholar, as a university scholar, I am expected to go and study him. So rather than going to the archive, I am going on strike, and I'm not going any longer to the archive in order not to transform him into my objects, but in order to undermine all this imperial presumption about temporality that, that relegate him into the past and keep me into the, in the present, going forward with an innovative uh, uh, research. No, no innovation in my research, just trying to reimagine the conditions under which we share the same space in order not to recognize Israel in Palestine but to claim this is Palestine. To do so, I meant also, I, uh, uh, to do so meant I had also to question my identity as a scholar uh, that is shaped through this commitment to newness and new interpretation. But I'll skip this in order to move forward. Uh, this was planned from the start as a refugee caravan that is unstoppable in a way. When the, these expellees are on the move, the violence of substituting the old, meaning Palestine, with the new, meaning Israel, is less perceptible, and we are expected to recognize in such images of caravan of refugees, we are expected to recognize in each and every one of them already a refugee, even before there are refugees, because they are on their move. They are being expelled now, but we are expected to recognize in them uh, refugees. So let me go back to this image. Among the accessible photographs taken when Jews expelled Palestinians from their homeland, this, uh, uh, this is the only one I know in which Palestinians' opposition to be deported was not filtered out of the archive. It is not about finding a proof of Palestinian resistance. It's obvious that they did resist as much as they could. I single it out so that we would not mistake it for a photograph of a refugee, but rather attend to this particular moment of his resistance to becoming a refugee. This moment when his claim had not yet been forced to occur in the past. As archival users, we are doomed to always come after imperial temporal and spatial divisions have been drawn. Yet, at the moment when he crouched here, what was meant to be unstoppable, this caravan of refugees, was halted. As scholars, we are expected to assume that the storm resumed, but we can instead attend to his refusal and join, join the chorus. His action shows that the movement of substituting Palestine with Israel was and is stoppable and reversible. 
We should insist on the right to always be present at moments when imperial violence pretended that opposition was gone forever. We should offer an erratum in retro prospect, even if the man was forced to continue to walk, as the people who surround him seem to want him to do, we should not be misled by their uh, success. They have not had a success. In the midst of the procession of people doomed to appear in, through, and beyond the archive as refugees, this man crouched. He could have been fatigued. This may have been true, but it cannot be enough to explain his action or his withdrawal from action, nor can it explain the gesticulation of these men around him trying to resume the flow of deportees. Firmly holding his cane while holding himself as close as possible to the land, Tsumud, without losing his grip, he looks back straight into the eyes of the man who dares to touch his shoulder while begging him to stand up and leave his country. With or without words, this Palestinian man refuses to follow what has been scripted for him, to move forward and inhabit the statue of a refugee. By that, he's refusing this imperial violence to embody the category of refugee. He refuses to let the archival violence be a fait accompli. He refuses to let document proclaiming the sovereignty of the state of Israel transform him into a stateless person, a refugee, a threat to the world of good citizens. He and many others refused and, uh, so, and refused and so to yield uh, the required results, turning him into a refugee from the begone past, hundreds of thousands of children born Israeli, with quotation mark like me, were needed. I am one of them. Many of them grow up and inhabit professional positions based on different bodies of knowledge that since 1948 have existed as Israeli. For example, Israeli art, Israeli dance, Israeli music. These bodies of knowledge either confirm the disappearance of Palestine or absorb and incorporate whatever was there before they were manufactured. In doing this work, I realized I needed to offer myself an erratum. This onto-epistemological erratum opened the door to reclaim my mother's identity as a Palestinian Jew from before the creation of the State of Israel. This identity was categorically denied to her and other Jews in 1948 in exchange for the imperial citizenship that was given to them. When Palestinian, as in Palestinian Jew, is restored as a shared adjective exactly as it used to be, the shared life of Arabs and Jews is no longer a question, but a matter of fact. This was Palestine that the state of Israel was established to destroy. Given that this catastrophe did occur, it now requires return, repair, reparations, not misleading diplomatic negotiations and agreements. Israeli scholars, like Israeli citizens, regardless of what they do or research, are manufactured to be guardians of this regime-made disaster, truth, truth guardians of the archival violence that keeps Arab and Jews apart. For years, I associated the separation of Jews and Arabs with the particular variation of the archival violence implemented by the State of Israel. When my father passed away seven years ago, and I discovered that he had deliberately concealed his mother's name from us, I started to see this form of archival violence as a major thread of the global imperial project, one that goes uh, as far back as 1492 to the expulsion of Muslim and Jews from here, actually, from Spain. I, but I will not dwell on the expulsion of Jews uh, and Muslims from Spain. I will jump immediately to Algeria. I was familiar with the insidious effects of granting citizenship to Jews in Algeria that were called at the time because they were not Jews. They didn't identify them as Jews, so they were simply called non-Muslims. So I was aware of the insidious effects of the Cremier law, the, cre the, the Cremier decree from 1870, but I could not anticipate how much impact this uh, decree actually had within families, my own family included. 
The name that my great, great grandparents chose to give to their daughter, which is my father's mother and which is my grandmother, was born in 18... Uh, 95 in Algeria, only 25 years after this decree, was an Arab name, Aisha. The French name Alice, by which my father related to our grandmother, whom we saw very little, so we couldn't really confront this, seems to me in retrospect to be my father's pure invention. I was always saddened by the fact that my father interiorized the colonial gaze and aspired to be a colonial figure himself. Uh, when after his death, I discovered his plot to impede us from knowing his mother's name, I enjoyed a moment of bliss. His parents and grandparents' uh, uh, resistance to become good citizens of empire emerged from strongly, sorry, emerged more strongly than my father's self-deception, believing himself to be French. And their refusal to be good citizens and to give their daughter uh, a French name was passed to me through this concealed name. Like many colonized subjects, he was lured by imperialism to turn his back on his ancestors and substitute their world for imperial documents. With my ma grandmother's name now mine, it's here, Aisha, uh, Aisha Cohen. With my grandmother's name now mine, the violence of the adjective Israeli as my identity is even more revolting. Reconstructing it as my family's Judeo-Arab legacy is yet another way to refuse to inhabit this imperial weapon called Israeli scholar and to partake in the collective attempt to bury my companions. Do you remember him? to bury uh, my companion's claim from June 1948 as history, as if it is only his story. The onto-epistemological onto project of errata is the necessary work of repair and return, necessary in order to attend to the wrongs inscribed in this world, and whose repair cannot be fixed with more documents. Thank you.